Hello and welcome. Happy Wednesday. This panel has been organized by the Piletki Institute as a segment of the ongoing summer school co-hosted with Valdosta State University in Georgia, the US. The panel falls into the framework of the Graduate Academy dedicated to totalitarianism in East Central Europe, 1939-1989, history and memory. Today, we're going to discuss um, an important part of the 20th century history, the big question about the aftermath of the Second World War. And before we get to this, let me quickly introduce uh, the panel. Monika Kareniauskaite is a legal historian specializing in Soviet and post-Soviet studies and a research fellow at the Lithuanian Institute of History at the, and the Law Institute of the Lithuanian Center for Social Sciences. She is co-author and co-editor of Anti-Communist Opposition in Poland and Lithuania, a similar, common, or parallel phenomenon, published in 2015. Welcome to the panel. With us also, there is Michael Nyberg, Professor of History and Chair of War Studies at the United States Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. He has published on the First and Second World Wars in the global context. Interestingly, the, the Wall Street Journal named his Dance of the Furies Europe and the Outbreak of World War I, published in 2011, one of the five best books ever written about the war. Congratulations, Michael. On that, his latest book is When France Fell, The Vichy Crisis and the Fate of the Anglo-American Relationship, published in 2021, this year. And I'm very happy to welcome also Richard Overy, who is one of the most renowned historians of the Second World War and an honorary research professor at the University of Exeter, United Kingdom. He has written extensively on the European dictatorships and World War II. So I will just, I'm sorry, I will just limit myself to your latest book, Blood and Ruins, The Great Imperial War, 1931-1945, that was published this year. Uh, Professor Overy is also a fellow of the British Academy. I'm honored to have all of you in my panel. Welcome. My name is Wojciech Kozłowski, and I will moderate this meeting. So let's get right into, into it. Um, we're going to discuss, as I mentioned, the aftermath of the Second World War in Europe, basically. And I want to approach it from various perspectives. We have a uh, very important, uh, well, an ex extraordinary opportunity actually to discuss uh, the, the Second World War from American, British and Central European or East Central European perspective. So, uh, but we first, before we get to this, I, um, I have found a very interesting uh, quotation by American soldier Alexander Clay in one of the Michael Nyberg's books um, um, about, well, this one was, basically about uh, 1945 Potsdam Conference. And he, was, uh, he remarked after this First World War um, the following, quote, I can truthfully say that without egotism, we, the soldiers of World War I, predicted that within 25 to 50 years, this war would be fought again. For we had a premonition that it was not entirely settled as it should have been. I would like to hear your comment, and maybe since this was in your book, Michael, I'll ask you first. Just a brief comment. What, uh, what, what's your response to that? First, I'd like to thank everybody at the Pileski Institute for holding this and for inviting me to be a part of it. It's a, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, it's curious that you mentioned that quotation. In class at the War College right now, we're reading Thucydides, where there is a a piece in the middle of the war that we just got done discussing, the peace of Nicias, in which Thucydides describes it in much the same way. He calls it a treacherous peace, that this is a, a pause in a much greater war, that it's, 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 it's not useful to think of a pre-peace of Nicias and post-peace of Nicias. It's one conflict. And I've, I've spoken with students a lot about thinking of this period, 
1914 to 1945 as a kind of second 30 years war, uh, at least in the, the European chronology, uh, or to think of it as the kind of short 20th century, that 1914 opens the 20th century, that is the 20th century that doesn't really close until 1989, when Soviet Bolshevism, itself a product of World War I, comes apart, and then you're entering a different kind of global dynamic. So I think there is some utility in thinking of this as one conflict, and it's why I was so struck by Alexander Clay's comment that you read. Thank you. Professor Overing. Uh, well, he's not the only person to have predicted in 1919 that there would be a war in 20 years. Um, by a long way, a lot of people, of course, thought that there was a lot of unfinished business. Uh, I, I think the important thing to say, of course, is that had certain things turned out differently, there would not have been a Second World War. Uh, if the world economy had, uh, you know, had not gone into meltdown in 1929, um, if there hadn't been a growing crisis of national identity among European nations in the 1920s and 30s, um, they, again, they might have found grounds for cooperation. So it's not inevitable, I think, that the Second World War will follow. Um, but there are strands from the First World War which are recognisable. They work their way through the 20s. They re-emerge in a strong form in the 1930s. Uh, and the Second World War is, is, is a way of trying to resolve many of the things that begin not in the First World War, I think, but the, you know, the end of the 19th century was the opening of, of uh, modernization, the growth of modern nationalism, uh, imperialism of Europe abroad, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of things going on which shape the 30 years. But I do agree that seeing this as a, as a conflict which goes on across that 30 year period um, makes more sense than seeing these as two entirely separate um, conflicts. Which to me is not that obvious thing. I mean, I always thought that it was the first world war that actually brought Poland back to uh, to the political map, and there was the second world war that would have followed, and it was uh, it was in fact a different conflict. But from this perspective, it's very very interesting. So um, let's jump from 1919 to 1945, and I would like to address uh, the opening question that I prepared for. Uh, each of you, and uh, perhaps this time uh, I would ask uh, uh, Dr. Monika Karenjauskaita to perhaps to take the floor first. But here comes the question. Europe in August 1939 and in May 1945, so in the big, just before the war and right after the war in Europe, was significantly different. The war has profoundly changed the continent and rendered it unrecognizable in many aspects. What would be your two most essential, I don't know, outcomes, political, social, or military responsible for the change? What happened during this war that made Europe completely different, apart from obvious things like complete destruction? Um, Monica. Yes, hello everyone. And I would like also to thank you for the possibility to be here and participate in this wonderful discussion. So I would start with two, uh, very, very broad outcomes, I imagine, but one is more uh, related to the Eastern Europe, Eastern part of the Europe, and the second one is with the Western part of the Europe, because probably the most prominent outcome was the division of Europe itself and the Cold War, of course. So, uh, well, I would uh, call this first outcome the change in the demographic, geographics and landscape of the Eastern Europe, uh, well, the change of borders and ethnicity was considerable, of course, uh, especially in the eastern part of the Europe. Extermination of the Eastern European Jews, almost extension of the ethnic, cultural, intellectual, religious tradition is one of the most obvious and terrible losses. Uh, in Lithuania, for instance, uh, the Northern Jerusalem concept shaped by such personalities as Vilma Gaon disappeared completely. And the few remaining Jews also emigrated and ended up in the US or South Africa and Western countries after, after the war. So uh, the extinction of the complete population of Jews, uh, just a few people remained. Uh, also in Lithuania alone, approximately 200,000 of Jews were killed during the Holocaust, which was more than 95% of the whole uh, population in the country. 
Jewish population. Uh, the only na not only Nazi, but also Soviet repressions changed the structures and societies. Mass destruction of local elites happened in Poland and the Baltics and elsewhere uh, by uh, deportation or such crimes as the infamous Katyn crime. We are in Poland now hosted by Poland, so I should mention that, of course. These changes in the occupied territories also meant uh, the enormous change in law systems, education systems, family structures. In Lithuania, for instance, the Civic Marriage and Divorce Institute was established uh, for the first time after 1940s. First, it was just a religious uh, institution, uh, institution of the marriage. Uh, those were uh, followed by uh, the formation of new elites uh, loyal to the occupational powers. The cities and uh, territories moved from one political and military regime or order to another. Gdansk, Vilnius are the examples here. Uh, Lithuania with the Soviet invasions uh, regained the Klaipeda Memel district occupied by Hitler and of course Vilnius in exchange of letting the Soviet military troops in, which also later led to the occupation of the whole country. Demographic changes were also considerable in many other ways. Post-war population displacements and repatriations of German, Poles, mass war and post-war deportations from Soviet occupied territories included uh, Baltics. Uh, I must also mention here the collectivization and demographic changes uh, connected to that. Uh, Gulag created a new class of people also that had a very, very distinct and different experience than the other, the rest of the Soviet population and uh, it developed a new criminal subculture, but also happened uh, to develop and maintain some networks of dissidents there uh, where political prisoners met each other and exchanged the ideas. Uh, also, Baltics uh, became more and more culturally and socially connected to Russia in both positive and negative way. Uh, as a dissident, ideas came from Moscow, from Sakharov, Kovalov, and such personalities. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the geographic space uh, shrank due to the Iron Curtain. But uh, new wide Russian and other Soviet Asian territories also opened in a certain way for the Baltic people uh, because yes, under Stalin, they were uh, lands of suffering, but later became even attractive uh, tourist uh, attractions or destinations. And also such things uh, changed the population as serving in the Soviet army, uh, completely different school system, kindergarten systems. They, these were just a few, a few institutional changes of the new reality that was, of course, much broader. And this and whole new socialization of the Soviet citizens, the new program to create a homo sovieticus, if you want. So at least in Eastern Europe, after uh, the war, it was not the same situation, not the same order. order. Also, uh, if I may continue, I would like to say that totalitarian regimes uh, changed the everyday life of Europeans. They experienced more cruelty, uh, a change in value and normative systems. Uh, yes, uh, it, it, must, it could be debated that, that aspect, uh, but uh, uh, we know that uh, strategies of both Hitler and Stalin were uh, to involve the local population in their crimes against humanity, to, uh, as Timothy Snyder, for instance, writes in his Bloodlands that uh, it, there were cases when Soviets, uh, it, after invasion of Poland spread this propaganda against the peasants, uh, for, for the peasants against the landlords, and actually it uh, helped uh, to increase the crime and the criminal actions against rich people. And in Lithuania, uh, also the locals were involved in Holocaust, collaborated with Soviets, both Soviets and Hitler in the post-war era. Also what is considerable uh, more bigger level of, of violence, including the violence against women, murders and rapes, not politically organized, but just uh, by criminals and uh, just uh, more violence in general is, is noticed. And the changed uh, structure is noticed uh, by the criminologists, for instance, here in Lithuania, that the motifs of crimes, at least as a document show, have, have changed. 
more uh, cruelty, more absurd crimes without any any kind of real motive, like uh, for instance, to rob someone or so on, just, just violence for the violence itself. And also, yes, uh, I should mention the Soviet industrialization and collectivization in the Baltics and Soviet version of the modernization and urbanization was this very uh, considerable aspect, changing all the landscape, changing the people's habits, uh, the destroyed cities like, like Vilnius and Riga were in partially built in the Soviet manner. Some of their spaces remained empty to, till today of the war destruction, so uh, changing even in the physical space, in the architecture and so on, very considerable. Uh, some uh, uh, buildings uh, like a former synagogue in Vilnius was ended up to be destroyed by Soviets. The, the job started by the Nazis already. And the, yes, the rapid change of style and lifestyle, everyday practices and so on and so forth, the demographic shifts, moving from Kona, uh, from from, uh, from countryside to the cities. Uh, yes, uh, Vilnius, first time in history, for instance, became the dominated by ethnic Lithuanians. Yes, we can also mention Balkans and Yugoslavia as an outcome when Tito gained his power and popularity and so on. So many, many aspects. Maybe I already exceeded five minutes, so sorry about that. So I'll just uh, mention briefly uh, the other very important thing, uh, what I think uh, happened in the West is the more integration, understanding that uh, Europe needs integration and the creation of the European Union based on this idea of post-World War II peace. So thank you. This is, thank you very much. This is always a big, big challenge for an knowledgeable speaker to get to two issues out of the whole big history of the World War. So I'm really curious what, uh, uh, what, is, what the sort of approach will uh, Professor Overy take now? Um, because now, from now what we know in the, e the East Central Europe, we, we talk about demography changes, we talk about uh, new reality, new order, uh, political, also about the values. We there is so many things in the East and in Central Europe that are happening. What are your two points that you would point to, Bob? Well, I mean, I might have covered some of the same points that Monica covered, I think, but uh, I'm going to pick out two. I think it's a difficult challenge. Um, the first is perhaps an obvious one, but you asked to start in May 1945, and that is that that the war ushered in two military superpowers. United States and the Soviet Union, um, and both those superpowers profoundly affected the way in which Europe behaved, both globally and in itself, over the course of the next 50 years. Now, this was not predictable. In 1939, the Red Army looked pathetic when it fought Pitt the Finns, uh, and won only in the end by overwhelming pressure. Uh, the German army thought the Soviet army was hopeless, which is why, of course, Hitler was confident about Barbarossa. The United States army uh, was ranked 17th in the world in 1939. It had a large navy, but there's no doubt that most military power in the world was concentrated in Western and Central Europe, France, Italy, Germany, Britain. Um, that was transformed by the war. Uh, Britain made a substantial contribution, but her military power ebbed away rapidly after 1945. Uh, the Soviet Union transformed itself militarily from an incompetent military establishment that echoed much of what the Tsarist army had done to uh, a, a, an army capable of destroying the Wehrmacht in Eastern Europe. Now, there flowed from that lots of political consequences, which I'm not going to deal with at the moment. It seems to me what was really critical about the war is that it ushered in uh, Soviet military power, which dominated the Soviet bloc for the next 50 years. But the United States, too, used the war, and particularly the war in Europe, as an opportunity to build a, an extraordinary military establishment, which simply didn't exist in 1939. In 1945, the United States was arguably the most powerful, militarily the most powerful state in the world. And it has remained more or less the most powerful state in the world ever since. I mean, conditions are changing in the 21st century, but for the 40, 50 years after the end of the Second World War, uh, 
American military power was quite extraordinary, symbolized, I think, by the dropping of the two atomic bombs, um, which did affect Europe. Europeans looked at that and they, they realized that a new age was dawning. It was an age that was going to leave them behind. And it's very significant that after 1945, either in Britain or in France, Italy, Germany, was any effort ever made again uh, to build up large military force, to spend a large proportion of national income on the military, or even to think about imperial projects that you might use them for. Now, that was a very, very big change. It's changed Europe from three or four hundred years of military power and expansion. Now, the second point I would make, and I, I, I think that this is a, a very important point. In fact, it's one of the central points I argue in my book, Blood and Ruins, the new book, is that this was the end of empire. Now, the destruction of the German empire and the destruction of the Italian empire were in themselves very important. It was a point at which Europeans had to say to themselves, it is no longer respectable to think that you can use military force to establish territorial empires. Now, Germany tried it, Italy tried it in the Mediterranean, and in Greece, the Balkans. Um, it was a point at which uh, empire, as it had been experienced by Europe for, again, hundreds of years, suddenly came to a sharp end. But in 20 years, the British and French empires, the largest and most dominant global empires in 1939, had evaporated. Uh, Europe became a Europe of nation states, no longer a Europe of nation empires. And I think that was a fundamental change. And I think one of the consequences of that change is that it became possible for Europe, despite the terrors and horrors of the, first, of the Second World War, to begin to think only a matter of years later about uh, coming together as a community of nations, no longer as a community of nation empires at each other's throats a lot of the time, globally. The world changed outside, the empires collapsed, na nations rose all over Asia and Africa, etc. Uh, but in Europe, the end of empire seemed to me to be a fundamental change in the way in which Europeans thought about themselves and about their societies. Um, so the defeat of German and Italian imperialism seems to me to have been uh, a, a central issue in May 1945, uh, and it's built the death knell for empires elsewhere. But I think it's enough for me, and I'll wait to see what Michael says. Thank you very much. So, Michael, demography, new communist regime coming to Central, East, Central Europe, the uh, new superpowers emerging, the destruction, well, the, the fall of empires, what do you say? One of the problems with being the third person in a three person panel of brilliant scholars is I'm going to repeat a few of the things that my, my colleagues have said here earlier. Uh, notwithstanding what Professor Overy and I said earlier about seeing this as one war, I'd like to propose here that there is a benefit in looking at the First World War as a war between nation states or empires, and the Second World War as a war between ideologies. There were no effective resistance movements on the Second World War model in the First World War. Because, with some notable exceptions, most people from 1914 to 1917, and please note my, my choice of dates there, identified with their state or empire, even with all the defects inherent in them. By contrast, in the Second World War, resistance movement that variously supported monarchical systems, communism, or democracy, all emerged to resist the continental expansion of fascism and its fellow travelers. The state imperial model of 1914 began to come apart around 1917 both because of the rise of sub-imperial nationalism in the successor states to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, like Poland and Czechoslovakia, and of course, the, the triumph of the transnational ideology of Bolshevism in Russia. Woodrow Wilson's worldview represented another, albeit quite different challenge to the old order, one based in global trade and an end to the anarchic Westphalian system. Although the Second World War emerged from some of the same dynamics as the first, as Professor Overy and I were discussing, the Second World War was, in some ways, a very different kind of war. It was, as I've argued, more ideological than national, with the democracies in Bolshevik Russia eventually coming together to destroy fascism. The event that served as the historical bridge between the War of Nations and the War of Ideologies was the Civil War in Spain, where George Orwell explained his volunteer service for the Spanish Republic by writing, quote, since 1930, the fascists had won all the victories. 
it was time they got a beating, it hardly mattered from whom. If we could drive Franco and his foreign mercenaries into the sea, it might make an immense improvement in the world situation, even if Spain itself emerged with a stifling dictatorship and all its best men in jail. For that alone, the war would have been worth winning." Unquote. We can debate whether Franco was truly a fascist, but the point remains that Orwell saw him as one at the time and saw the Spanish Civil War as a key front in an ideological war across the continent. What happened to Spain mattered to him far less than what Spain meant in a growing ideological, political, economic, and social struggle. Ironically enough, in most of Europe outside of Iberia, by 1945, this process destroyed fascism, leaving democratic capitalism and Bolshevism as the two most powerful ideolo ideologies remaining. They had proven that they could coexist, even thrive by working together, but the absence of a common enemy brought into sharper focus their existential differences. I have argued elsewhere that at Potsdam, the Americans at least, believed that a future of peaceful coexistence was still possible. Truman had not yet given up on Roosevelt's idea that the United States and Soviet Union could work alongside Britain and China as four policemen that would govern the globe. The American use of the atomic bombs in Japan and America's growing suspicions about Soviet intentions in Poland and elsewhere quickly led to a more menacing and mistrustful attitude. The victorious ideologies of 1945, moreover, were in turn most powerfully championed, as Professor Overy has mentioned, by the United States and the Soviet Union, two quasi-European states that moved in to fill the vacuum left by the decline and mutual exhaustion of Germany, France, Italy, and Britain between 1914 and 1945. Europe's fate after 1945 lay now not in the hands of its traditional powers, but in the hands of the Americans and the Soviets. Second point, we should note the many social and demographic changes, as Monica did, ushered in by the end of the war. In the East and center of Europe especially, the Soviet Union ethnically cleansed whole nations as its armies moved West, forcibly lining up ethnic and political borders in Europe, even if doing so meant creating a mass refugee and humanitarian disaster. The departure of most of the last remnants of Europe's devastated Jewish communities for the United States and Palestine slash Israel had a similar effect. Thus, genocide and ethnic cleansing by the war violently redrawn the map of Europe. There were now far fewer minority populations to destabilize empires or to serve as targets or models for irredentists. This process meant that the old conflicts of Europe were less likely after 1945 to be the engines that produced wars in the future, especially because the occupying powers of the United States and the Soviet Union soon took up their positions. The superpowers saw intra-European conflicts as distractions to their wider attempts to position themselves among their European allies and client states. A bipolar European order began to develop with half of the continent looking with lesser and greater degree of eagerness toward Washington and the other looking toward Moscow. To the extent that some British and French leaders disliked or mistrusted this new arrangement, they were soon distracted by anti-colonial wars from Madagascar to India to Indochina. These wars drained resources even further and encouraged both the defeated and the victors of 1945 to look to collective security and economic integration as strategies for post-war survival. Finally, although these were powerful forces, nothing was yet set in stone. President Truman took some time to commit himself and his administration to a permanent American presence in Europe that eventually included the massive economic assistance called for in the Marshall Plan and the formation of NATO. By then, the American analyst George Kennan had already laid out the containment doctrine that would guide American and NATO policy for the next four decades. On that basis, a new world order based for the West on democracy, integration, and economic prosperity could begin to form. That new world order would have been unrecognizable to strategists in 1939, to say nothing, of course, of 1914. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, at first glance, it sounds like there is a little bit of dissent about the understanding of the nature of World War II conflict. So I need to give a moment for Prof uh, Professor Overy to, to respond whether because I, at first glance, it looked like that. On the other hand, I'm not sure whether the war that brought down empires cannot be the war of ideologies. So it doesn't have to be uh, completely impossible. So what, what, what's your take on that, Professor? I mean, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, my point, I think, is, would be that, that um, 
ideology matter, but you can actually live with ideologies that you don't like very much. I mean, you know, we all live with communist China very easily, uh, very comfortably, actually. Um, my point I about the 1930s is that what actually unhinged the system was not, as far as I can see, ideological difference, but the fact that uh, Mussolini's Italy, Hitler's Germany, and of course, uh, militaristic Japan, all decided at that point that the global order was in such deep crisis, was not likely to be rebuilt again along the lines of the 1920s, um, and that the real uh, success story was the British and French Empire. Uh, they were protected economically and so on. It was the root of their global power. And that if they had empires too, they could join the imperial club, even perhaps supplant Britain and France. And so that's, that's why my focus is on empire. Ideology matters, of course, because uh, the Second World War, when it broke out, the British and the French, and later on, of course, when America joined the war, uh, it was very important to contrast democratic ideology with the ideology of, of fascism and national socialism. Uh, it was very important to make it clear that this was a, you know, a, a, a moral crusade against an evil force, or in the case of Japan, against Japanese militarism. Of course, ideology matters. But if in, in Germany, Japan, Italy, you'd not have radical nationalist circles who sat down and said, you know, the answer to our problem is territorial empire. It wasn't the answer, of course. Their pursuit of territorial empire quickly led them into a situation where they had to wage more war. Uh, the more war they waged, the more dangerous it became. And they ended up fighting the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, so it was a bad decision, but it, it does seem to be that that geopolitical argument is in some ways often neglected in the way in which we approach the Second World War. Uh, and that's why I you know, put forward this imperial paradigm. Thank you. And, and I'm just very curious about uh, Monica's perspective, whether you see what happened in Central Europe and Lithuania uh, in the first place um, during the war. Was it, a con well, some sort of clash of ideologies, the Soviet and the Nazi, or the Soviet, Nazi, Soviet again? Or was it the conflict of empires that, um, that simply Lithuania found itself in the middle of? How, how, how would you react to that? I think it's actually both, uh, but uh, like I also tend to, the, the deeper I go in studying uh, the Soviet Union and the Soviet structure, how it worked and uh, how it was organized, uh, the more I come to this conclusion that Soviet Union could be actually called as empire and that uh, the process of joining new territories was so, sort of colonization. Uh, one uh, reason why I think so is because uh, they using a certain way of, of using their resources that uh, most of the resources, well, uh, Soviet had this uh, kind of idea, propaganda, Soviet propaganda claimed that yes, we uh, occupied uh, those territories like Baltics, for instance, and uh, we brought modernization, we built factories and so on and so forth. So we did a big investment, but actually, uh, a lot of production made in the Baltic countries and even uh, money was taken back to the to the center of the empire, to the Moscow, to their budget. So they are kind of helped to, to, uh, to fund the Soviet bigger <laughs> projects. So I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm also kind of thinking about the perspective of law because, uh, because that's what I know the best. And the legal system was also very much uh, I think it working in, in the way that it was colonized, colonized by, by the Soviet Union and observed by the Soviet Union. And yeah, not mentioning that cultural cultural colonization. And why I'm also convinced more about the idea of the empire than maybe the idea of the ideology is uh, when, when we think about the Soviet politics of nationality, that it was not always really denying the national feelings, but trying to create the framework for those nationalities to work within the Soviet framework and even give some sort of uh, exist, a, a space to exist, some very limited and very Sovietized though, but still so, some sorts of national identity to, to really build the loyalty to the center, to the empire. So I, I don't know if that's, that's really convincing, but I just, would like to hear more, maybe on that, and yeah, well, and we definitely, I, 
will definitely continue. I mean, this is um, what what you all said reminds me of this very classic uh, way of approaching empires, like you have center and peripheries, and uh, you have then Moscow's the Soviet Union, and you have all those newly acquired uh, territories and lands that are actually used to to fuel the economy and fuel the um, the, the the rest at the core of the empire but on the other hand if you look at the uh, nazi germany this is exactly what they're doing in uh, in general government and the way that they're uh, using the many territories is exactly in the same manner on the other hand uh, we can talk about those new empires that look legitimate i mean they look for legitimacy in ideologies and this is perhaps the, the way we can actually have uh, have a meeting point point here but i would like to move a little bit forward or perhaps moving forward by making one or two steps backwards because i want to talk a little bit about goals and in the war because if we want to assess and evaluate in any way the aftermath of the war the question is what world war ii was about for americans for the brits and in your case for lithuanians so maybe and uh, maybe we come back to michael uh, you already mentioned a little bit about that, and Professor Overy also explained that there was this element of facing evil, fighting against against Nazism as um, well as an image of simply evil politics. Uh, but I don't want to answer the question for you. So, what was the, the Second World War about? Well, in Europe, we, we can leave out a little bit the, the Japanese here, but the Americans. I actually think it takes a while for the Americans to figure this out. Um, it, it's 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 confused for the Americans. Uh, the United States, I, I argue in the book I have just coming out, uh, the Americans are quite shocked by the fall of France. Uh, they had been, to use a modern political science term, free riding on French uh, strength and on British naval strength. When that goes away, that there is a real confusion as to what you should do and what the world ought to look like. There is additional confusion in joining in an alliance where the, the very much the big partner is the Soviet Union, it's Joseph Stalin. I think it actually takes a while for the United States to figure out what it wants the post-war world to look like. Uh, and there is a difference, of course, between the way that Franklin Roosevelt perceived it and the way that Harry Truman perceived it. Uh, Truman wants to take the ideals of Woodrow Wilson, the ideals of the 14 points, but he wants to back those ideas with strong American power in a way that Woodrow Wilson was uncomfortable. Uh, and it's notable that when Truman took the oath of office, when Franklin Roosevelt died, he did it underneath a portrait of Woodrow Wilson. Uh, but, the, 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 but in the sense that Wilson came to the Paris Peace Conference, hoping to win the world over with ideas, Truman wants to do it with more raw power. He wants to bring American economic power into Europe, the possibility of a long-term military presence, and of course the atomic bomb and to use that in a diplomatic uh, fashion as well. So I actually think it's hard to determine. The American soldier was notoriously unideological in Europe. We have a lot of evidence of this. Uh, it's not until the, the first discoveries of the concentration camps that Eisenhower can say something like, if the American soldier doesn't know what he's fighting for, now he knows what he's fighting against. So it's not quite so the, the same thing, thought, I think. Wait a minute, does it mean that the big landing in Normandy is, is in a sense, pointless for the Americans? Like, that they, they have to, I mean, I don't want to sound too, uh, too extreme here, but from what you're saying, it's like they had to discover concentration camps to actually find this moral judge, uh, well, justification for the, for the move. Well, I think there's a difference between moral justification and the, and the realities of geopolitics. Uh, the United States okay. had been promising the Soviet Union a second front for a very long time. Uh, there is the need to, to um, make sure that France especially, but the low countries as well, come under a British American influence at the end of the war. There has to be a way to get into Germany, even if not all the way to Berlin. So there are geopolitical reasons to do this. Uh, but but no, but famously throughout the American army in World War II, uh, the army is is surveying soldiers and finding out that that, that there is a kind of um, uh, a lack of ideological conviction. What they're trying to do is win the war in Europe so they can go home, which is a little bit different. And they of course can only do it because home is three thousand miles away. Uh, there's also a war with Japan that will need to be finished. It's a different context for the United States than it is for the European countries. Thank you very much, Professor Overy, for the Brits. 
Uh, well, I've actually heard about, about the United States, but I'll, I'll stick to Britain. <laughs> but, no, go I mean, ahead. No, no worries. No, 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 so you I, know, we have these unique uh, perspectives. I mean, the yes. collection of two superpowers. And, yeah, yeah. And uh, well, no, I mean, I agree with what Michael right? said. There's that wonderful story about the competition they had in uh, Italy for the American soldiers there to why I'm fighting. And they had to write an essay. And one just wrote, I was drafted, and he won the prize. <laughs> um, but anyway, coming back to Britain, I mean, the problem about Britain is, uh, you know, there's a, 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 a mixture of uh, ambitions going on in the Second World War. It's ironic that the person who choose, who, who's chosen to lead Britain in the 1940s, Winston Churchill, old-fashioned reactionary, an arch imperialist, a racist, and, uh, and his ambition, of course, is to, is to create a war situation in which Britain's power can survive and its empire reasonably intact. Now, by 1945, that's a pretty, pretty strange ambition still to have, uh, but he's surrounded by a, a great many people uh, in government, even in the armed forces, too, who share that view that the war is, is of course, it's against wicked old Hitler. But it's actually a war, too, to make sure that Britain survives and the British Empire survives and goes on. Uh, but for much of the British public, that's not what they're fighting for. For much of the British public, what they're fighting for is they're fighting, they mobilised in 1989, uh, to fight against fascism. And more and more, they're told that fascism is, is a wicked thing. Um, it's quite interesting when you see pictures of uh, bomber aircraft being bombed up, ready to go off to Germany. Uh, you know, people write on it. You know, message. You know, a present for Hitler. Things like this. They personalise it. Hitler is an, is is the evil genius uh, of the new Germany, uh, and the British public wants to get rid of Hitler. Uh, Mussolini matters less, but they want to get rid of him too. The Japanese war means actually very little to British people actually throughout the uh, throughout the conflict. Uh, but the critical thing uh, is is this tension between a British public that wants democracy to survive, uh, if possible, wants more social justice and so on, the opposite really of what they perceive in fascism and so on. And Churchill, who's you know one of the arch imperialists who doesn't care much about social reform. Um, and whose views of democracy are, to say the least, uh, not terribly robust. Um, and the judgment comes in the general election of 1945. Churchill is thrashed at the polling booth. Uh, the Labour Party comes to the power, and the Labour Party is committed to democratisation, uh, to social justice. Uh, in the end, gets committed to unravelling the empire as well. So that the outcome in 1945 in Britain is that the, the wider public that took this view of the war against Hitler as a war against the, a, an evil thing which had to be rooted out is the one that wins out in 1945. Uh, the elite view in Britain that they wanted to uh, protect Britain's power, protect Britain's empire, emerge in 1945 as one of the winners, but still one of the players worldwide. Uh, and they are the ones who are disappointed what I found particularly wonderful about your answer is that you again married these two perspectives. I mean, the elites are fighting for the empire, but the public is fighting the ideology. Yeah. So that that's all. I mean, we started with that, and this we is did, just coming back. Yes, they are married I, I together. That's very interesting. Uh, so, how about Monique? I mean, what what do you how how would you explain um, the war? I mean, the the, the experience of war uh, for uh, for your country. So I probably would uh, not go deeply into British or American politics, which I'm not really a specialist in, but I would rather mention their interpretations of British and American politics during the Second World War here locally in, in, in the Soviet and later Nazi and then later Soviet Lithuanian region, or I, I, I'm not sure about Poland, so please <laughs> uh, correct me if I'm not, uh, not right, no but worries about I, I had this idea uh, that uh, there was a high expectations uh, in the Eastern Europe that uh, this world uh, war will kind of help, like uh, that we will eventually receive the help from the West in our struggles, not for Nazis, not for the Soviet goals, but for our national state goals, independence. And I think what looked very promising, at least in Lithuania for the resistance for the opposition was this Atlantic Charter and the right for self-determination, then later the creation of the United Nations. 
And the, the promise of, I don't know, that uh, nations, yes, this repetition again of, of, of the democracy, free election and the right for uh, uh, national states to choose their own fate. And yes, those promises were actually the biggest, I would say, uh, ideological power rather agent or real to sustain uh, the post-war opposition movement in the Soviet Lithuania armed resistance movement, which in the, if you look in their documents, they're always quoting, quoting those bigger uh, global documents, quoting that, uh, uh, hoping that the West will eventually invade the Soviet Union, that there will be another war, and that's how the Baltic region will be liberated. So that that was, we were, uh, I think the, the the region of the Baltics was looking were looking into uh, UK and looking to in, into US to finally invade Soviet Union and liberate us like a bigger superpowers. Which brings us again to uh, uh, to points made by uh, Michael that Truman uh, was uh, so much into into those ideas of fourteen points uh, of Woodrow Wilson, but at the same time, uh, it seemed as if those nation state uh, type of um, well, of building countries according to uh, the self or ser it's it's a nice term. I just slipped. Um, self determination. Uh, yeah, self determination was not really. Uh, it didn't work out in after after the first world war. So it seemed like it's not going to work uh, anymore. Um, I don't know, but what we have here reminds me of a story that I learned from Roger Morehouse at some point uh, last year. We discussed. Uh, the, um, the different experiences of Eastern and Western Europe about the, the end of war. And um, of course, we discussed it in terms of um, allied armies coming and bringing liberation to, uh, well, to the French and to the, to the Western nations. And then uh, we're looking for a proper way to describe the experience of Central Eastern Europe, which was, as he nicely put this, uh, it was the liberation without freedom. So we were liberated. I mean, the Soviet Ar Red Army came and liberated us from the Germans, but at the same time, uh, it was it never brought uh, freedom into, in fact, into the picture. So, Monica, would you would you uh, would you agree that this is this is how we, you yourself would would see the, the past of uh, of Lithuania? Is it? I think I think when you look to, to historical documents, testimonies, and all that documentation, yes, definitely you can detect that pattern. And I think what was also very considerable is this uh, confusion, first of all, and then maybe disappointment that we hoped they will uh, the West will do something about it, but they didn't. We were left like under the Iron Curtain. We were left under the Soviet rule, and it's it was like. I think uh, people, some people just felt bit betrayed by the West. And that was uh, e even in, in the 90s in Lithuanian historiography, when Lithuania finally got the right to write their own, not the Soviet type of historiography, this pattern was repeating and repeating and repeating. Yes, the West betrayed us. They betrayed Poland. British betrayed Poland, for instance, not involving actively when the Nazi Germany first attacked. And it was like, yeah, the Eastern region uh, didn't, didn't matter for the West. They have different goals, but we hoped so, so much. We hoped for that in invasion. <laughs> so and yes. yet, still in summer 1945, Michael mentioned the Americans believe that they can live well and cooperate with the Soviets without starting the Third World War. And I want to uh, point to that one more thing. The Poles also left, uh, well, well, felt abandoned and betrayed by the Americans and Brits in Yalta and in Potsdam. And we have been left to the Soviets who entered Poland already in, in September uh, 1939. So question to, to Michael and Professor Overy. What do you say to those sentiments that, that they're basically fact-based? We know that, but uh, what? Why did it happen? I mean, why did it have to happen? Uh, and I need to add this small, more, more little question because 
because we both are military historians, did really the Allies need Amer uh, the, the Soviet army to defeat Germans? And was it necessary? I mean, was it possible to win, to defeat Germans without the, the Soviets? But that's a side question. So the first one is, how did it happen that we in Central Europe felt so forgotten, abandoned, or betrayed? Because you, yeah. Uh, Michael, maybe this time. Yeah, I, the, you know, the, the memoir of the American ambassador to Poland in World War II is titled, I Saw Poland Betrayed. And he wrote it shortly after the end of the war. And when I was in the Warsaw Rising Museum in Poland, there's two quotations on the wall. One is from George Orwell and one is from uh, George Kennan, both decrying this, both saying, you know, this is a terrible thing that the West is doing. Uh, Orwell's is, of course, incredibly articulate, as is Kennan's, but it's something, it, both of them speak to abandoning your friends when you shouldn't have done it. Uh, and there is a moment at Yalta where Leahy essentially turns to FDR and says, if we sign this agreement, we're leaving Poland to the Soviets. And FDR says something to him like, it's the best that I can do. Um, all I can say is what the Americans hoped was, if there was nothing the United States could do to stop the Soviets from the physical occupation of Poland, the hope was, and I agree that from 70 plus years on, it looks a quite naive hope indeed, but the hope was that if the Soviet Union allowed free and fair elections in Poland, the Polish people would vote in a government that would be anti-Soviet, and that would give the United States an opportunity in the post-war world. So I fully recognize that it takes a lot of naivete and it takes a lot of wishful thinking for this to be true. But the expectation in 1945 was, you certainly do not want to provoke a third world war with the Russians while the war with Japan is not yet won. If the American people didn't understand a war against Germany, they're not going to understand one with a country that it had just been allied to you. So the line that I use in the book is if, if Poland was a, a cause to go to war in 1939, it was not one in 1945. Uh, that may be to the great shame of the Western statesmen, but the way they were looking at the problem, uh, Poland was not worth risking a war with the Russians. Thank you, Professor Overy. Well, I mean, I would add that Poland wasn't the cause in 1939 either. There was no intention at all of helping the Poles. Uh, the British and French had their own staff meetings all the way through the uh, spring and summer of 1939, in which they said there was no way they could militarily help Poland, even though they tried to give the impression that they might. Um, they, they said vaguely, we'll try and reconstitute Poland later when the war is won, the war is over. Um, I mean, the answer, of course, is simply um, military and political realism. You know, there was no way in which the Western states could uh, liberate Eastern Europe after it had been liberated in inverted commas by the Red Army. Absolutely no way. There was no way of battling away through to Poland. Uh, and of course, uh, no, the promise of enormous difficulties if you did that. I mean, Stalin understood that. I mean, he knew that there were limits. He wasn't going to push too far either. Uh, so both sides, uh, took a, a realist view of what had been achieved in uh, in Europe. But that meant, of course, you know, writing off the, the, the future of Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, and so on. Uh, a telling moment, I think, and I think it's worth reflecting on this, is the Nuremberg trials, um, which were planned and began in 1945, of course, uh, when a great effort was made uh, by the Americans and the British to avoid upsetting the Soviet delegation uh, by mentioning Finland or by mentioning the Soviet occupation of Poland uh, or mentioning the, the Baltic states. And indeed, they remained silent about those all the way through the Nuremberg trial, all the way through, almost a year of that trial, they remained silent about these. And it's very interesting because Robert Jackson, the chief prosecutor of the United States, had a file um, marked aggression and inside uh, there was a photocopy of the secret uh, protocols to the Nazi Soviet pact. <laughs> um, it was put away. No action was written on it um, because, uh, you know, in 1945, uh, the Soviet Union was unpredictable. It was a huge military power now. It was not something you, you wanted to mess with. Uh, and you'd achieved most of what you got, in fact. You, you know, liberated Western Europe. You were about to liberate Asia from Japan. Um, 
you weren't sure what the Soviet Union was going to do. You know, in 1945, you don't know what the Soviet Union is going to do in Europe over the course of the next five years. Um, so any idea of, you know, of, of pushing on further, of liberating the rest of Europe, uh, which Churchill himself briefly thought about in May 1945, it was quite out of the question. Thank you for this. Um, I'm just let's shift the focus from Central Europe into the uh, bigger and greater politics in, in, and establishing what Michael already mentioned, a new world order uh, with, again, now Professor Overy, two superpowers, the US and, and the Soviets. Um, we know the Treaty of Versailles was considered flawed because it weakened Germany too much, perhaps, or simply it humiliated them and created space for revanchism and for all the uh, all of the other actions that actually led to, to the Second World War. Now, how about Yalta and Potsdam? And the lessons taken and learned from, from Versailles? Because what I get from historiography, people at that conferences were hardly, I mean, were very much considering what happened in Versailles. So, Michael, maybe we'll start with you. I, I argue in the, the book I wrote on Potsdam that they're consciously trying not to do whatever they did at Versailles. So there is no formal treaty at the end of that conference that um, Truman has to take before the US Senate as Woodrow Wilson did before the Senate in 1919. Um, th there are three countries that are running that show, the United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union. Uh, there's a Polish delegation, I think, that's there for two hours, maybe. Uh, there's no French representation at all. This will be done by the, the great victorious powers. It's a very different kind of peace uh, conference that they do. It's not even technically a peace conference. Um, the other thing that you mentioned, I, different senior leaders at that conference have different ideas about what the fundamental flaw of the Treaty of Versailles had been. But one that they agree on is that the entire idea of reparations had been misguided. And this idea leads to an idea that comes from the American Secretary of State, James Burns, that in lieu of reparations, the best thing to do might be to divide Germany into four sectors, temporarily, he believed, and let each of the four powers get what they would get out of Germany or do what they would do in Germany without a long-term reparations process like they did at the end of World War I. Uh, so it's too simple to say, but I think it's not a bad throwaway line uh, to use in a classroom that the men of 1945, uh, if they didn't know what to do, they almost did the exact opposite of what their predecessors, or in some cases, the exact same people had done in 1919, because people like Burns, Keynes were there at both conferences. Thank you, Professor Aubrey. Sorry, I was just going to add something. So, I mean, it is worth remembering, too, of course, that, that in 1919, the problem was, you know, the United States was, a, a, you know, in many, many respects, a kind of infant great power. Uh, Russia wasn't represented at all. Um, and, you know, we might weaken Germany. But in fact, what 1919 does is strengthen Britain and France, uh, which is one of the reasons why, of course, things unravel in the 19th is. The difference in 1945 is that the two superpowers, the two powers with real military muscle, are there making the decisions. And I think that's the biggest difference between Versailles and, and Potsdam. And they're all aware of it, of course, you know, it's not going to be, you know, a whole lot of little uh, states in Eastern Europe, which we're going to try to protect, you know, and, you know, their nationhood intact, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a power political conference. And this brings me to a question. I don't know, Monica, would you like to contribute here to this, to the issue or? Oh, I think I, I agree with that perspective. Okay, um, because this brings me to a question that I learned at some point, uh, I think during my uh, university studies, which for some reason I, I just simply missed earlier. There is no peace treaty after the Second World War. Now, why there is no, I mean, you, you hinted to that. I mean, Michael, you, you mentioned they didn't want to have it because they wouldn't want to repeat Versailles. But is it the only reason? I mean, like, we don't want to have a peace treaty because, I mean, if you think about war, you think, yeah, let's conclude it with a peace treaty at some point. So what happened? There are several reasons. Uh, one is the 1919 model, which Truman is terrified of. Uh, but the other is the sense that when you sign a treaty like the Treaty of Versailles, you're signing a static document, even as the world around you is becoming dynamic. So you're tied to the language in the treaty, and that 
less flexibility moving forward. So there's that issue as well. Uh, it's also the case that they did not intend to sign a treaty at Potsdam. They intended merely to have a conference of the three great powers. Uh, shortly after Potsdam, relations between the US and the Soviet Union turned very bad indeed, making it less likely that they would have agreed on treaty terms anyway. Uh, but I think it's the first that mattered the most. It's Truman's sense of not wanting to fight with the US Senate over details in a treaty. Uh, and it is the sense among people like James Burns, uh, not a nice human being at all, but a very smart one, who recognized that a, a static document is no good in a rapidly changing world. We should add, by the way, that, 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 that there was a peace treaty with Japan and a peace treaty with Italy. It was with Germany who didn't have a peace treaty. Yeah, that's absolutely right, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, but this, but so if they went for those treaties, this means that the, the issue was that, what, well, the Germany is a very special case and because it's yes. too big or it's too central mm -hmm. or it just has the two more turbulent story behind it. Germany is a special right. case. Yeah. Italy will be occupied if, to the sense that it is occupied. It will be done by the United States. The same is largely true, though not exclusively true of Japan. Germany is the problem. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons why Stalin insists that a post-war conference in 1945, the last big conference of the war, uh, will be held in Berlin or its suburbs. Uh, th there is a message to be sent here that Germany has done this twice. Germany will not do this a third time. To the extent that Italy is an issue, of course, it had surrendered to the Allies effectively in September of 1943. Germany, for European pr uh, uh, perspective, Germany is the issue. So, because we have only 10 minutes left of our conversation, I would like to think in other terms about the aftermath of the Second World War. And I want to shift a little bit to the, the memory issue, uh, that is how the, the Second World War is uh, remembered today in, in various countries. I mean, you, uh, I know Monica can, can share her, her perspective and I'll ask you to, to do it in a second. I know that Michael has written a piece on the on this political use of the memory of the Second World War uh, in contemporary Amer America, and I believe Professor Overy has a lot to, to say about it. So let's just have think about um, the aftermath, meaning the how the what is the standard perspective or or understanding uh, of the Second World War today in your respective countries. Uh, Monica, go ahead. Yes, thank you. So uh, I would first start that the Second World War is imagined in the context of occupation, Soviet occupation, Nazi occupation. It's not just war, but also like the occupation, what's, what strikes the memory the most. And uh, this uh, post-war military resistance is very important aspect here. Uh, and debates are taking place in uh, West the Lithuanian, for instance, anti-Soviet resistance, the regular army, or just uh, the partisan army and so on and so forth. Then uh, the collaboration with the Nazi uh, Germany and with the Soviet Union is very, very sensitive topic so, until, until today, because uh, what, one part of it, I think, is that uh, under the Soviets, uh, Lithuania really didn't have this chance to reflect on the uh, Holocaust and on the build uh, some sort of uh, structure of the historical memory integrated that that experience and of course integrated the soviet experience was was a problem too but somehow in the 90s that experience i think was was integrated but the holocaust experience was somehow excluded from the narrative of of the his, his historical consciousness and i also think the other thing is that it's like it's this big image of of the nation of lithuania as a victim is still persisting Yes, uh, we talk about resistance, but this resistance is also imagined in the framework of victimhood rather than some heroic uh, narratives or heroic pictures. And uh, even repressions are imagined through the very ethnic lens that it's, it's the aggression against Lithuanian. So uh, such uh, periods or, or such uh, things as, for instance, deportations, sovereign deportations of Jewish population is excluded from the narrative and so on. So, but, but I think what's the most sensitive uh, right now, it's still unfortunately the Holocaust and that triggers the most of the debates and the most of the, if, if you want far right uh, nationalistic uh, feelings and uh, yes, and they have 
course clash with more liberal feelings in the society. And it's, it's actually a hot topic. And another very hot topic is what to do with the heritage of the Soviet occupation, what to do with the material heritage, which is still also triggering a lot that fears or it's not yet integrated, I would say, and not yet dealt. And yes, and the last probably would be that uh, this upsetness of not having the justice for Soviet war crimes, uh, something like <laughs> Soviet Nuremberg or something like that. And yes, feeling of injustice. And yes, and not discussing all, also the collaboration with Soviets that it, the dominating model is that if Lithuanian, ethnic Lithuanians were involved in the Soviet system, in the Soviet structures, they were not collaborators, but rather in this way, they were just helping somehow to maintain the Lit Lithuanian culture and so on. So that's probably the, ma the main points. Yeah, and, 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 and Vilnius is, is still kind of not discussed that topic, but for Poland, it meant different story than, than for, for Lithuania. Well, I mean, not discussed, it's, it's probably discussed in cer certain uh, circles like uh, circles of historians and professionals, but not uh, so much in the mainstream mass media. But but now it's changing more perspectives with, with the change of generations, more recognition of those traumas and so on. Thank you, I'll be happy to continue that topic, but we need to give some space also for our other panelists. Uh, Professor Overy, what, what's, what's your contribution here? Well, I mean, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I mean, there was a mixed reaction in Britain, of course, as, would, as one would expect. Uh, but I think the important thing about the Second World War is it's been embedded for a long time in the national narrative, but that Britain was heroic. Britain was standing up against Nazi Germany when everybody else had disappeared and so on. Churchill, of course, is venerated in Britain as a, you know, as a, as a kind of saint. Um, uh, and I think that that heroic image of Britain uh, in the Second World War is very important in the national narrative because after that, you know, Britain declined relatively, the empire was lost and so on, uh, and Britain in a sense lost its way. It's quite striking that the Brexit debates, uh, a lot of the Brexit debate involved the Second World War, you know, that this, this was, you know, going back to looking at Britain, you know, uh, liberating Europe from, uh, from, from Nazism, but not Britain wanting to join Europe, but quite the opposite. Um, uh, and I think that, that um, not being occupied, you know, not having a civil war, not having all, you know, the Gestapo around the corner during the Second World War. You know, Britain's view of the Second War has become increasingly domesticated and sentimental. But the, what I would say was that for a great many young people in Britain, people at school, um, universities, the critical thing about the Second World War is indeed the Holocaust and remembering the Holocaust. Uh, there's there's a, an illusion that in some ways, Britain and the United States fought the war in order to save the Jews. Um, uh, and um, you know, it's ironic that of course, that was not why they fought the war remotely. Um, and the Holocaust has become in some ways a central motif uh, for younger people in thinking back to the Second World War. Um, but for older people, and certainly for the generation that experienced it, the Second World War was a, a moment of uh, British heroism, David against Goliath. Thank you, Michael, the greatest generation and all this. Well, it's no coincidence that the United States Army's new uniform looks like the World War II uniform. They're even calling the formal jackets an Eisenhower jacket. Um, <laughs> and that's symbolic of what the war has become, but it wasn't always this way. Uh, there have been some very ambivalent depictions in American culture, including one of my favorites, uh, Joseph Heller's Catch-22, which is a very ambivalent uh, book. Uh, but this has ebbed and flowed. The direction in the United States after Vietnam and again after 9-11 has been to look back at the Second World War as an ever more glorious, more heroic, more black and white kind of uh, war, with the notable exception of the Japanese internment here in the United States. Uh, which is always taught as the kind of one asterisk to an otherwise uh, heroic event. And uh, I echo both, both of my colleagues' comments about the Holocaust, which is taught here as well, I think very poorly. Uh, if this war was fought to save the Jews of Europe, that strategy was executed very, very badly indeed. Uh, that's not what the war was about, uh, but it has become uh, emblematic. And ever since Tom Brokaw's Greatest Generation, we have been uh, bombarded with those images as well. So. 
the image here is very much one of a heroic war as it is in Britain, uh, with much of the ambiguity and much of the, uh, the, the, the real lessons of the war either not taught or, or taught as almost an afterthought. Uh, just this reminds me uh, the, the issue about the what to do with mater material heritage. It's not only the question in, in Lithuania or even in Poland, well, concerning the, the Soviet past, but I just learned today that in Richmond, Virginia, the statue of Robert Lee was uh, was removed. Yeah. And so in the, in the United States, you also have a question what to do with material heritage of well, more distant past, that's true, but still it seems like the past is quite quite vivid and important. Um, I think our time has uh, just elapsed, which means I have. I would like to uh, thank my panel uh, for this uh, public discussion. I think we are supposed to stay a little longer for, uh, for the summer uh, school participants, but I would like to uh, Thank you for uh, this uh, really interesting, from my perspective, conversation. And I, I really miss the, um, I mean, I just, I regret we don't have more time uh, to discuss many more issues because um, we just opened so many uh, boxes and I will be very happy to into them. But for now, thank you very much. And I believe we can uh, finish here our streaming and our uh, official uh, meeting and we move on to uh, to the meeting with the participants of the summer school.